Welcome and good evening, everyone. Welcome to the final event in our M Word Town Hall series, Politics and Power in Pop Culture. My name is Clarice Raza Sharif, and I'm the Senior Director of Literary Programs at PEN America. PEN America is an organization whose mission is to celebrate creative expression and defend the liberties that make it possible. We believe in the power of a written word and the freedom to write here and abroad. PEN America is a membership-driven organization with members all, in all 50 states. So I welcome you wherever you are um, to check us out at pen.org. And if you are inspired by the work, uh, join us, become a member, or uh, just follow us on social media. The M Word series is a series, programming series that is really near and dear to my heart. It's launched in 2016 thanks to the support of the Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Arts Building Bridges program. We couldn't have done it without their support from the very start. The M Word Town Hall series focuses on centering American Muslim voices fostering understanding, using the power of narrative and storytelling, and bringing together writers, artists, and thought leaders across a range of genres, expertise, and platforms. This week, we hosted a conversation on Clubhouse with Muslims and Friends, where participants discussed their vision for the future. And last night, we hosted an in-person town hall with live music, poetry, and a panel discussion about the ways we navigate the multiple identities um, uh, in the community, especially among Muslim creatives and how, what they bring to their uh, practice. Tonight, we have a very special uh, treat and a very special conversation. Uh, we are featuring heavy hitters from Hollywood for our final town hall event, Power and Politics in Pop Culture. Thank you for being here. Thank you to our partners, Sapelo Square and Empax Hollywood Bureau, and to our funder, the Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Arts Building Bridges Program. So now I will join the audience and listen in and take it in. And it's my honor to turn it over to our moderator, all historian, scholar, writer, a dear advisor and friend, Zahir Ali. Thank you so much, Clarice, uh, for introducing me. And thank you so much, PEN America, for holding this space for us to have this conversation. Um, by way of visual description, for those of you who may uh, may not be able to see me. I am a black, brown-skinned, bald-headed uh, man wearing a black t-shirt with a very um, plain background um, uh, behind me, um, white on one side, brown on the other side. Um, and this, we are broadcasting this conversation on Crowdcast, and we want you to be part of the conversation. Uh, this is a town hall, so use the ask a question box at the bottom of your screen, and we will take your questions throughout the program. We're also going to have questions for you, so be sure to add your thoughts in the chat. Um, I want to start by referring to a report that was released earlier this month called Missing and Maligned, the Reality of Muslims in Popular uh, Global Movies. This was a report that was jointly done by USC Annenberg Inclusion Initiative, Riz Ahmed and Left Handed Films, the Ford Foundation and Pillars Fund. And it looked at 200 popular films from 2017 to 2019. And of the nearly 9,000 speaking characters, only 1.6% were Muslim, even though Muslims comprise 24% of the global population. And of those Muslims, only a quarter of them were uh, female. And so the stats got worse. I mean, if you, you we will put a link to that report for those of you who want to check it out. Um, and, you know, the, like I said, the stats got worse. Uh, we know that this is more than just a problem of representation. It is one of power. And to help us talk about the politics of power, um, 
the politics and power in popular culture. We are honored to be joined by this amazing panel working to shift not just the representation, not just the narratives, but the power behind television and film. And so I'm going to introduce each of our panelists up and then we'll launch into the conversation. Uh, first up, we have Marguerite Hill, who is the co-founder and executive director of the Muslim Anti-Racism Collaborative, a human rights education organization. She worked with Samir Gardezi to launch Break the Room, which led to the digital series East of La Brea. Marguerite, why don't you provide our audience with your visual description? Thank you. So I'm um, a black woman, African American. I have a blue scarf on my head and a pair of large black earphones with a little headset and um, a floral shirt um, patterned with um, blue and, and blues and purples. In my background, I have a gold and white room divider and there's a plant to over my left shoulder. So um, yeah, and I also have a pair of glasses, so that's new. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Marguerite. I look forward to hearing more from you throughout the evening. Joining us uh, is Maha Tusi, who is a multidisciplinary artist and co-founder of Boom Gen Studios, the premier incubator and pipeline for entertainment content about the people's myths and cultures of the greater Middle East. In 2020, he found founded Starfish, a first of its kind creative IP accelerator investing in proven Black, Indigenous, people of color artists um, he is also currently executive producing United States of Al, the hit CBS primetime comedy. Mahyad, why don't you provide our audience with your visual description? Let me unmute myself. Hi, great to be here. Thank you, Zahir. I'm Marguerite. Uh, wonderful to be part of this panel. I am a, um, a brown, Middle Eastern, hairy man with a giant beard that joined me during COVID and has refused to leave. Um, I wear black like all the time and tonight is no exception. And I, um, I am currently in my office in Brooklyn. I sort of go back and forth in LA and Brooklyn, um, which is uh, sort of a this glass enclosed uh, sort of a space uh, with Brooklyn in the background. All right, thank you. And and y'all, when he says a beard, he really means a beard. So um, <laughs> thank you, my God. Um, joining us is Dr. Maitha Al Hassan, who is who authored the landmark report, Hawk in Hollywood, illuminating 100 years of Muslim tropes and how to transform them. Currently, she produces and writes for the Golden Globe and Peabody Award-winning Hulu series Rami and serves as an executive producer for the upcoming docuseries American Muslims, A History Reveal, something that I'm also working with her on. So always happy to have her join us for conversation. Maitha, provide our audience with your visual description. Thank you for having me, Pan America and Zahir. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. I have long, black, curly, wavy hair. My skin color um, by Venezuelans <laughs> is, uh, they called me Arequibe, which I think is like some sort of like caramel dulce, like a dulce. I have pictures in the background and a door and a little sneak peek into a kitchen. And I'm wearing a sleeveless, romper and I have some gold necklaces and gold hoop earrings that are kind of small for me. All right, thank you so much. Uh, and joining us is Sue Obedi, who is the director of Impact's Hollywood Bureau. Behind the scenes, she works to engage decision makers and creatives to improve the quality and number of authentic nuance and inclusive presentations of Islam and Muslims uh, so that audiences can see Muslims as vital contributors to creating social and cultural change in America and the world. Sue, why don't you provide our audience with your visual description? I sure will. Thank you. Salam alaikum, everyone. I'm just so happy to be here with you. And thank you, Pan America, for this wonderful panel. My name is Sue Obedi, and I am, I am Middle Eastern. I have black shoulder length hair that is actually brushed, although it doesn't look like it. I am wearing 80s retro big glasses with a white blouse uh, with black, a black trim around the neck. I'm living uh, in a suburb of LA called Cerritos. I have some Islamic art behind me and some 
pillows um, that are embroidered, like Palestinian embroidery. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and it's so nice to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. And last but never least is Franklin Leonard, who is a film and television producer, cultural commentator, and entrepreneur. He is the founder and CEO of The Blacklist, the company that celebrates and supports great screenwriting and the writers who do it. Franklin, why don't you tell us your uh, visual description? Uh, of course, uh, and thank you all for having me. It's really great to be here. Um, I'm a black American uh, with sort of mid back length dreadlocks. Um, I have a, a what in a vacuum would be a large beard uh, in the context of my beard <laughs> is maybe half the size of his. Um, it also has a little bit of salt and pepper uh, like my hot ends here. I am also wearing a black t-shirt uh, and I am sitting in front of my, my very overstuffed bookcases that are filled with books, both sort of vertically and horizontally uh, and family photos uh, and mementos uh, along those lines. So, but I'm um, very happy to be here and honored to be a part of this conversation. All right, so thank you. So before, as we dive into our conversation, we'd like to pose our first question to the audience for you to begin thinking about. And that question is, who was the first Muslim character you remember encountering on screen? Who was the first Muslim character you remember encountering on screen? So fill up the chat box with your responses and we'll get some of our panelists to respond um, as we move into the conversation. So now let us dive into that conversation. You know, when we talk about the power of popular culture, we tend to think about uh, the most visible, most audible, most legible manifestations of power in terms of representation. And all of you work uh, beyond representation in production, in consulting, in research, in pipeline, in amplifying, in advocacy. And so what we want to think about right now is what does Muslim storytelling power in popular culture look like to you? So I want to first throw this question to Marguerite because of your work on Break the Room and East of La Brea. So Marguerite, what does what does Muslim storytelling power look like for you? Yeah, well, storytelling power is is really the 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 ability, right, for for Muslim storytellers to have self determination, right? That's not necessarily driven by by institutions that don't understand Muslim communities, right? And and so the power of storytelling, right, is to be able to tell our stories that speak to our realities, um, and for that to not be hindered by by tropes or institutions that are defining who we are for us. And so, you know, like that power can come from, from different places, whether that is like organizers, like they're the, the screenwriters are, Muslim screenwriters are working together to organize, right? And to push for change um, that's happening on studio levels, right? Where um, there are allies and, and Muslim uh, creatives and executives who are working to push for change. And so the power comes from both institutional change, it's the power of the audience, right? For Muslim audiences, like when we think about one out of every four people in the world is Muslim, right? And, and to think about the power of, of us as an audience and the power of the American Muslim community to respond and, and help, um, you know, help propel those stories and, and to promote those. And so we have a lot of power. It just hasn't necessarily been tapped to or leveraged in a way that actually benefits not only our community, but for those who are interested in learning more about Muslims or seeing that you know our stories can also be universal. So Mahyad, um, Marguerite talked about um, tapping into this uh, power. Um, tell us a little bit about your work with Starfish Accelerator, which is an, it work to tap into this at this pipeline. Um, uh, I think Starfish is a, so let me just tell you what it is, a creative IP accelerator designed to scale big pop culture ideas from mid-career BIPOC artists. And um, for me, as a Middle Eastern Muslim man who's been sort of trudging myself forward uh, in this industry for the last God, 20 years, and specifically with Boomgen and, um, and our company for the last 16 years, 15 years, um, uh, you know, I, I had a shift around 2013, 2014, where initially all our focus was how can we support A, ourselves and people like us in our community to advance 
um, to recognize that the obstacles that we were facing were also obstacles that people of different other backgrounds faced. And that uh, the best way that I could support um, my cause and the cause of people like me is to support the cause of all the other communities because we were all f confronting the same obstacle. You know, while our life experiences were unique, um, the systemic uh, uh, biases that we were facing, the problems we were facing were the same. We're dealing with the same bias system, with the same uh, sort of a racist attitudes, uh, with the same sort of a legacy business that tends to um, f favor repeating, you know, things that they deem successful. All the things that are sort of th that are wrong with the industry is what all of us come from other communities face. And so I found um, that there could be greater power in uniting uh, people of color and people whose experiences as that of an other person, because in and of itself, being an other within this society is a unifying idea and that we have so much in common in terms of our shared vision of the future. So how can we build a community based on our shared vision of what we want this, our community to be, our future to be, and tap, capitalize on that so that we can share resources and knowledge and experience in order to be able to accomplish our goals together. And um, so that's sort of been, for me, the source of power and what, what I'm excited about is not is as a as a uh, as a Muslim immigrant man in this country is to support all communities, other communities to advance their cause, uh, because that's how we live in a better society. Yeah, I really love that. And I definitely want us to talk about um, the role of, of collaborations and allyship. Um, so before we get to that, I wanted to ask May, uh, Maytha, because of your work in contributing um, to the Pillars report. So the, I, I, I cited the missing and maligned report, but then Pillars issued a blueprint on Pillars and this coalition with Riz Ahmed and Left Handed Films, um, the blueprint for Muslim inclusion, which was something you contributed to. Um, tell us what, you know, what was unique about this blueprint? Because we've, you know, uh, many of us have crossed paths with each other over the last, I guess, four or five years, various pop culture, entertain change. Um, there's been, you know, a lot of organizing and advocacy work um, and intentionality behind working to deal with the issues of power and narrative change. So, Maytha, tell us a little bit about the blueprint for inclusion and, and what was so unique about it. Yeah, so uh, Pillars in collaboration, as you mentioned, Zaheer, with Left Hand Productions and the report that was, uh, it, when we were in the process, the report that was going to emerge with USC Missing and Maligned, we decided that we wanted to provide tangible solutions in concert with numbers we knew were going to be horrible. As you mentioned, 100 out of 181 films, uh, 200 films that were surveyed across the US, Australia, and New Zealand, they did not have any Muslim characters. The representation was 1.6%. And the more stunning um, statistic that most of us probably know intuitively is that of the Muslim characters of that 1.6%, about 39% primary and secondary Muslim characters were violently aggressive, were part of the terror tropes we are all so familiar with. and. That number, I just want to give people who are listening an understanding of what that number means. Out of 1.8 billion Muslims, if we said and portrayed them that way, the expectation is 700 million of us are terrorists, right? That's what we're visually consuming. So what we wanted to do, given those numbers, given the damage that is done to our community, we decided to convene Muslims across industries and some allies in philanthropic positions, in film, in agencies, and survey if they could dream up what would be a, a solutions-based scenario for these numbers, what would that look like? And so some two uh, very big asks that we have within 18 months, one is to sunset those terror tropes, because clearly there is a really unfortunately powerful effect that those terror tropes have when they operate in a hyper visible vacuum where most of us are erased, right? Um, and as we know, the report also mentioned 
that black Muslims, women, children, and of course, Muslims across the polycultural spectrum, um, queer, disabled, all missing, right? Or dramatically underrepresented. And so we, we, we asked to sunset those tropes so that as folks have been talking about, we can infuse those narratives that include all of us. And then the next ask was for studios to create a first look deal with a Muslim within 18 months. I know these are ambitious asks, but we also included industry specific asks from vendors to unions to agencies. And you can take a look at the report for those details. I encourage folks, it's online, it's not long. And uh, we surveyed the community for those results. Thank you. And it is, it's quite an incredible um, report. So we encourage you all to, to do that. Um, I, and so we've, we've talked a lot, it's come up the role of allies and the role of collaboration. And I want us to um, move into talking about that some more. Um, Sue, yeah. um, talk to us about the work that you have done in terms of developing these collaborations with people in the industry and how that has helped shift the power. And, and while you're doing that, we get, we're get we getting some of the answers. So I want our panelists, uh, other panelists to look at the chat box and see some of the answers to the question of the first Muslim character that you've encountered. And we'll, I'm looking forward to hearing some of your thoughts, but Sue, tell us about the work that you've been doing and why these collaborations have been important. Absolutely. I, can I just say something about Mayhad's response? Because I want to just build on it. Yes, yes, um, yes. You said something that we're like, we're pretty much like other underrepresented communities. And there's a step ladder approach to to um, influence, right? There is, they, we, we start off with the first thing is presence. And, you know, every immigrant organized, every immigrant community begins with presence and then after presence there is um um tolerance which by the way that is a horrible word because we don't want to just tolerate each, tolerate each other and then after tolerance is respect and then after respect there's influence and i just i just want to just say that how proud i am of all underrepresented communities to be you know banding together and and going through this and, and we are no different and we are going to have that influence that we have been dreaming about and it's because we're standing on the shoulders of others. So I just wanted to just piggyback on what May had said because I am a woman of a certain age and I in my in my visual description I did not, you know, say I, you know, how old I am. But yeah, I mean MPAC has been doing industry outreach for for pretty much since the media awards were founded and that's how we actually positioned ourselves about 30 years ago and this year we actually celebrated our 29th annual media awards but because we had to skip last year so this really would have been 30. that is how we got into the business by positioning this award show where industry decision makers would come they would then establish relationships with us on consulting on giving feedback on you know providing them you know talent this i'm talking about years ago from there, we did one-on-one -on -one networking. We then from there went on and did partnerships and collaborations. We had this thing called the Hollywood Summit. We would take 15 to 20 um, emerging college and graduate students around Hollywood to do roundtables with decision makers at CAA, CBS, ABC, all over. But because of the demand in the industry after Donald Trump was um, really ran for pre the presidency and then won, the demand shifted, and so we then have to sh we had to shift, and that's where the screenwriting lab labs came in. The partnerships with the Blacklist, with the Black House, Wise Entertainment, Wayfair, and a few others. That's where all that came in. So when we when when the industry evolved, they started reaching out to us, saying, "Hey, can you identify some talent that you can we can hire?" We then needed to like shift our um, our. MOU, you know, our way of doing things. So it was, it's been a journey. I mean, it's been a journey and it hasn't been easy, but I personally, I, I know um, that the report is, um, you know, showing very dismal, you know, um, numbers and I'm not going to refute that at all, but I, but still, I do believe ultimately we're going, we're creating a critical mass and this critical mass is going to be changing 
changing the world really. So I'm, I'm personally hopeful. So you mentioned the work with Blacklist, which brings us to Franklin. Um, Franklin, this past, uh, I guess this year, um, you the Blacklist collaborated with Impact Hollywood and Pillars to develop something called the Muslim List. Okay. Tell us a little bit of how this came about and why this was an important um, project for you to undertake. Yeah, so the, the Muslim List, um, like you mentioned, was a collaboration between the Blacklist, uh, Impact, and Pillars, and, and really, I'll say what it is and then try to provide a little bit of the context about how it came to be, but it was a list of 10 exceptional screenplays that was written by at least one Muslim writer um, that the Blacklist could vouch for the quality of the screenplay in terms of execution, story, et cetera, and that Impact and Pillars both felt you know, strongly about these are the stories we would like to see in the world. Um, and it, it was really born, you know, I, I want to echo everything Mahad has said about um, you know, the need for all of us to collaborate to sort of, you know, if, if, if none of us are free until all of us are free, right? It's not a party till everybody's there. It would be the other way I've, I've said it. Um, but, you know, we are all, we're, we're, we're situated in a system where the, the ideal scenario for literally everybody who's a part of that system is a marketplace where people who have talent or merit can be rewarded and have opportunities equal to their talent and merit. And I think we all know that that's not the case right now. And, and we, as we see as a consequence of that, these, that these numbers that don't reflect uh, the talent that we all know is out there from all these communities. Um, and being a part of an other community is an impediment to having the opportunities that fit your merit. And the irony, of course, is that if, if everybody had those opportunities and it was a truly meritocratic system, not only would we see better movies in television, we would see more money for those movies in television. Um, and so there's a real incentive, I believe, and have always believed, for the industry to embrace that diversity on those various communities and artists' own terms, because then we'll get to see the full flower of what the culture can produce. So with that assumption, uh, the Blacklist, and we see as our primary goal just to find the best screenplays, period, uh, began to collaborate a few years ago, first with GLAD for the GLAD list, which was a list of 10 screenplays from the LGBTQ community. And we've since done a number of other lists, um, the Asian Pacific Islander community, the Latinx community, the disabled community, the indigenous community, really just to say, if our job is to inform Hollywood of the best stuff that's out there, this is one way that we can do that job because Hollywood has a history of undervaluing these stories. And so if we're going to to service the industry by telling them these are things you need to pay attention to. We need to place extra emphasis on this stuff, right? Shine a slightly brighter light on it. And then separate from that, you know, what, what we all hear all the time is we would love to make these things if only we could find the scripts, right? And so what we also wanted to do was say, you know what, that excuse is no longer valid. Here's some great stuff that you will profit from if you make we've done the hard work for you, and maybe this can be the beginning of a process. And, and what I'll say is, is that we saw a lot of people reading the scripts that were on this list and others. Um, and so like Sue, I'm hopeful, but I think it's really important that we're constantly interrogating not only what stories are being you know, spotlit, but what stories are also getting the resources to get made and, and the autonomy that the, the creators have to tell the stories as they see fit. Um, again, Doing that is all in the best interest of the industry and everybody who's invested in it. But those are also critical elements that I think follow from, hey, here's a list of great scripts. And I think we need to be mindful of that. Thank you. And I think those are all excellent points. And I'm, I want to come back to you, Franklin, to talk a little bit about what some of those scripts were. Yeah. But before, before we do that, um, I wanted to see if our panelists have any responses to our first question, some of the responses we've seen. Um, you know, what was the first Muslim character that you encountered? And is, would anyone like to volunteer? Because I, I, I asked the question and now I'm like racking my brain because I, I can't yeah. even think. <laughs> Frankly, do you, do you want to say? I, I don't have an answer, which is sort of the scary thing. Um, and I don't want the, like, yeah, I, I, I'm really drawing a blank here. If I'll be totally I'll, honest. I'll, I'll, I'll By answer. By the way, it kind of says it all. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll answer it, which is sort of a really bizarre, weird answer. I was trying to think about it and I, two things came to my head. So first of all, I grew up in Iran. So seeing Muslims on TV was kind of normal uh, for me. Um, so having said that, um, from a Hollywood perspective, um, the first time I think I remember and I was struck by seeing a Muslim on screen 
was not a Muslim character. It was a Russian character. It was, was Omar Sharif in Dr. Zhivago, which I must have watched 10 times as a kid. And, but I knew he was Egyptian, right? So I knew he was a Muslim, he was Egyptian. He was from my part of the world. And that lasted with me. And then the second Muslim character that I remember was not played by a Muslim, was Anthony Quinn in The Message. <laughs> was not played by a Muslim, but was playing a Muslim character. Right. So, so it's, it's just an interesting thing to point out because the complexities of character versus uh, uh, identity of the person who's playing that character and identity of the character. So, and But both of those two things for me landed quite positively. Because one, the character, you know, was it was just so lovely to see that character as if I mean I haven't even seen the message in years. I shouldn't yeah. I don't even know. Like I'm curious with Maifa's uh, uh, report card and the messages, but <laughs> but as a kid, uh, that was like a very moving for me. And then uh, and then seeing Omar Sharif and Dr. Jivago. Love that, love that. And, well, well, and obviously, most- yeah, Mustafa Ahmed was such a big member of our community in Los Angeles. So it's uh, it's it's interesting. He did come and from for, the who was that, Maitha? For the director of uh, the message and your favorite Halloween films. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, that's right. That's right. right. <laughs> um, so Muslims can, I... can Muslims can do a whole bunch. Of, yeah, I, I I would love to comment on the the. The, um, um, yes, quickly, Maitha. Oh, yeah, 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 sure, sure. Okay. So Orlando Bloom and Antonio Banderas, the folks who mentioned that, it's funny because they're non-Muslims paying to a medieval sort of film. So 13th Warrior, um, Kingdom of Heaven. So that, And then, of course, there's a contemporary one, Dahlia Qadir in Greg's Anatomy. Just, it's interesting. I mean, of course, mine was, not of course, but Princess Jasmine, sadly. And then Malcolm X <laughs> later, even though that film came out a week before, Aladdin did. All right. Uh, I was Marjorie, actually gonna say, uh, yeah. Uh, Franklin, you were you going to say? No, no, Marjorie was going to Marjorie was going to say something. Okay. So, I mean, it, I think it, you know, for for me it was like what what when I realized okay that there were Muslims. So, so a, a hood classic, right? Car wash. So, I grew up it was like car wash was funny. So, that was a black <laughs> Muslim brother, right? And it, you know, uh, it dawned on me. So, we we're talking like I don't know when that was 70s, but I grew up to that movie. And then then Roots Right. So, so, you know, so basically part of, you know, growing up, we, we knew about Muslims in some ways. And so it's looking back, it's like, oh, here's some depictions of Muslims in film. Yeah. Roots was definitely mine as well. Sue. Yeah. No, I mean, I'm, I, I'm going to do TV and I put the link because you wouldn't believe me. I mean, I put the link um, in the chat and it was the bionic woman. Oh. Um, yeah, and it was horrible. It was a rich oil <laughs> sheikh who had a, I, I promise you, you got to look at the link, a long sword and a harem and was speaking of violence and was very obsessive, uh, uh, um, oppressive and, and obsessive. Um, and it was with Lance Kerwin. And I know this totally dates me, but I, I did see all of the movies that you're talking about and I, I, they landed on me. But the first one was really the bionic woman. All right. I, okay. I think the Morgan Freeman character Azim in Robin Hood was mentioned in the chat. Yeah, and I that was awesome. That was one that, that definitely might have been the first time I was like, conscious of it. The other thing I was thinking about, and anybody who follows me on social media knows I'm a huge soccer fan. I actually think that as a non-Muslim, separate from scripted characters, the sort of first Muslim folks that a lot of people outside of the community are aware of are athletes, right? So one of the first sort of Muslims who I knew I wanted to be was Zinedine Zidane. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that there are a lot of folks right now who would love to be Paul Pogba or Mohamed Salah. And and I think it speaks to the extent to which representation matters because, you know, if you're in Liverpool, you've got folks chanting about how, you know, if if Salah scores another goal, they'll be in the mosque with him praying on, you know, over the weekend. (laughs) And that, that that is... That is, that is a Liverpool chant, right? Yes. Uh, and, and, and he is, you know, creeping sure, yeah. <laughs> but I think that speaks to, yeah. you know, Mohamed Salah is one of the best footballers in the world, and that makes people say, maybe I need to think about my assumptions about the Muslim community a little bit differently. And in the same way that we can have characters that are fully human and heroic and just happen to be Muslim, and that is still a part of their identity and guides how they interact with the world, that can be powerful, and and that's a power that I think Hollywood is, has failed to recognize, and to the extent that they have, hasn't been responsible about administering it. And and I just want to say that Franklin presented at our media awards a couple of years ago, 
But Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, um, Franklin was one of the, it was the second media award. No oh, wow. Yeah, okay. no, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to yeah. date that, yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, okay, those are great uh, responses. Uh, our next question to the audience while we continue diving into this topic. So the next question to the audience is, what's a movie or TV show that includes or is about Muslims that you'd like to see? We're not asking you to give away your IP, but just what are, <laughs> what are, what is a, a project that you'd like to see or a character you'd like to see um, and so that brings me back to the, the Muslim yeah. list, Franklin, um, the list that, that was selected, the 10 selectees. One of the things that struck me positively was I think only one of the 10 mentioned 9-11, which was yeah. so important to do that kind of shifting that Maitha talked about in, yeah. in, um, in this report. So I wondered for, for, from your perspective, what surprised you about either the scripts that were received or that were selected? And what do you think think um, would surprise the industry about these scripts? Well, it's funny. I think the, the, the script that references 9-11, actually, uh, Blue Veil by Shireen uh, Alihaji, um, only uses 9-11 as the point of departure. And it's not like a sort of tortured investigation of a Muslim family sort of dealing with the fallout of that. It's actually about um, a, a father and daughter who sort of moved to a small town in America to be anonymous and then win the lottery, which makes that impossible. <laughs> <laughs> which is, I think, a really fascinating way into, like, how do we talk about the hypervisibility of the Muslim community in small town America? Well, if you win the lottery, in a strange way, your being Muslim becomes the least of your concerns in terms of your day-to-day -day interaction with literally everybody you encounter. Um, and I think that that's, for me, the thing that was most exciting about this list was it was all scripts from you know, Muslim writers who were writing about Muslim characters, but that wasn't the overwhelming focus. It was about sort of them doing other things while also being Muslim and in really interesting ways. I mean, uh, Kuram Mustafar's uh, script, Four Monsters, begins with I four monsters it. Yeah. mix up Hollywood's favorite villains into one ridiculous road trip. Zombies, vampires, aliens, and Muslims. Uh, and it's a zombie, <laughs> ostensibly a zombie outbreak film in LA um, that, you know, uses the idea that initially it points to a terrorist attack, but actually it's, you know, zombies and vampires and aliens, etc. So I just think I've also been a big believer for a long time that being an other, being outside, let's say, this sort of hegemonic demographic group creates all these opportunities to do really interesting things storytelling wise, right? That there are specific experiences, specific imaginative conceits that can only happen to characters who are part of those communities because of the assumptions that people make about them. Um, and so I think that there's a lot of opportunity there just for good storytelling of the sort that the industry defaults to uh, commercially. Um, but also, again, it, it's a weird thing to say what surprised you because implicit in that surprise is some some assumption about yeah. what Muslim stories are. And my assumption is that those stories are literally just as diverse as literally any other community. And so Muslims in space, Muslims in vampires, Muslims winning the lottery, whatever it is, you know, Muslims playing drums, whatever it is, like, those are options. And that's what we should be seeing if the scripts are good. Um, and we know there's an audience for it. So that, that was sort of my response to it. A lot of it was just like, I hope someone makes these movies because they sound like the kind of thing I would pay money to see. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the 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 four monsters was really a favorite um, when I read the descriptions. Um, you know, the the there are challenges in in telling our stories that we have we face from the industry outside our communities, but also in from within our communities. Right, this sort of pressure to to get a story right or to get the story right. So I, I want us to grapple with that a little bit. Um, Marguerite, we'll start with you. Um, what? How did? How did you all navigate that when you were thinking about East of Librea? Yeah, well, the the idea of East of Librea really came out of responding to, to two major crises, right? Well, we had the the Muslim ban, um, and but also hate crimes targeting Black Muslim women, and how that was also erased. So the Max stabbings and the murder of Nabra Hassanin, and so humanizing Black Muslim women and centering them in that narrative was really important, and so. so 
When we thought about developing the project, we really wanted to imbue it with anti-racism from a framework from the story to the who was able to be in the writer's room to re really rethinking that, not just your, you know, typical actors or not actors, but typical folks who would make it to a writer's room, but people who may not have, may or may not have those opportunities. And so so we knew we wanted to talk tell a LA story. We knew we wanted to tell one that spoke to the intersections about a neighborhood that, you know, in South LA, little Bangladesh, um, telling a story about the this diverse community that included Central Asians, Bengali, um, Asian Americans, whether it's like Japanese, Korean American, and and Black folks, right? And and that by telling a Black Muslim t story, you could have you know talk about all these social issues without making it like a Saturday morning special. And so the LA became was it was a character too. But some of the things that we had, you know, we did think about who was our audience. And for us, like in in doing the work was we wanted a story that spoke to to Muslims, right? To Muslims in their 20s trying to figure out life and and trying to get by in, in a very difficult to navigate city, which Los Angeles is. I love Los Angeles. I'm definitely like a transplant to Southern California, but it has its own particular character. And, and we felt like that story needed to be told. And so, you know, we we did that with support of philanthropy. Um, and with the guidance of Samir Gardezi, who who is a who is an industry insider, and so his mentorship of taking those four fellows, um, who are, ended up being just brilliant writers and and going on and and being you know superstars within themselves, like Halima Lucas is just doing amazing work, and there's Tandizwe, Nia Malika Dixon, and Tanha Dill, like they all just did an amazing job of telling that story and and they did a really good job partly because of the chemistry that we had in that room and some of the frameworks that we had and, and we knew like since we were not thinking about the traditional pipeline in Hollywood we were thinking about there's alternative ways of telling stories there's alternative mediums like there's there's the sort of new frontier that's opening up where people are you know like where they're using social media to distribute content and that's what we eventually did do and so this idea of like in many ways like we just need a chance to produce stories and demonstrate this is what happens when you could talk about these social issues but you could also center the characters and their journey. And it could be good, it could be funny, it could be heartrending. And we wanted to demonstrate that. And we weren't necessarily thinking about the, um, you know, the traditional route, but here are some alternative ways where we could distribute. And so that we could show like, this is a possible model. And in what ended up happening is Samir was able to go on and take that model and create more break the rooms and create more pipelines for Native American writers, for Pacific Islanders, those from like, you know, Pacific Islanders, uh, Southeast Asia, um, and and other writers, like Canadian writers, uh, LGBTQ writers, and and his model of just creating new new pipelines and new writers and everything has helped diversify the field and and help kind of equalize and create more opportunities. That's that's great, and and I think we've posting the link to Issa La Brea um, for those who want to check it out. We encourage you to do so. Um, so we're going to move. So I, I, that's interesting. Was we, we talked about the social media distribution. And we're going to talk about a streaming show, which was <laughs> Rami. And that brings me to May. So Rami, May, you know, Rami is like a real difficult character to love the character. Right. And I think that people transfer their their feelings about the character to the feelings about the show. And, and this show was met with certainly a lot of fanfare, but also criticism. And so I wondered how, how did you all grapple with that criticism um, and how did it shape the work that you do? Yeah, I so I just want to be clear with folks what my role in relation to Rami is as well, so that I don't become the stamp representative of Rami's vision. <laughs> Um, I came in as a creative advisor initially in season one, and then season two was brought in as a staff writer. And then in season three, which we just wrapped the, the writer's room, I got promoted to co-executive producer, which is remarkable uh, for a shift for people in the audience that don't know these levels in WGA. Um, so I, I've been slowly brought on in more of a leadership role in this work and but but Rami to his credit always saw me as a thought partner in the process of digging through really deep themes that 
Arabs, Muslims, people from New Jersey <laughs> deal with. Um, so uh, yes, there have been a, a variety of responses and reactions from so many different communities. We hear from people who had never watched anything with Arabs and Muslims or had watched things with Arabs and Muslims that this was the first time they really understood our community from folks who weren't a part of it. Then there were people, and I heard this actually, especially from Arab women, that this was the first time they saw themselves on TV. Absolutely the first. And so I'm, what I want people to think about is the character of Dina probably is one of the first lead Arab American women characters um, on TV. I mean, I think Quantico, she's, she's I, I, I'm not sure, I'm not gonna say that, but um, I think she is also foreign because we're always portrayed as foreign, right? Um, so that's really powerful to have after how many years of TV making for the show to, to do that, even though it's led through the eyes of a cishet Arab male. And that was some of the criticism too. People thought that that was such a standard sort of supremacy in our community that they wanted to see something more interesting. But you know, the, Rami, the show, the, the leading question is, what, what do people wanna be and who are they really? So what is that, that gap between those two things? And that's what we explore. And of course, some of the other things become part of our storytelling, but that's really the guiding question around this Arab Muslim family from Jersey, this Egyptian Muslim family from Jersey. But I'll tell you something which is fascinating. A lot of people had problems with masturbation, with adultery, with, um, adultery at the, uh, from meeting somebody at the mosque during Ramadan. They were like, How, when would that ever happen? And then I'm like, well, when do you ever take off the blinders from your eyes? Because um, <laughs> um, of course it happens and people don't wanna confront their own communities. But when it's been distributed in the Middle East, we've gotten such a powerful response and not that sort of conservatism that we, or that and no shame to conservative, like folks who are conservative, but it was surprising how receptive they were to that storytelling, even though it was their compatriots in the diaspora. Um, so, you know, we, we hear what people are saying. Um, clearly, we're thinking about those sort of responses, but listen, Rami can't be everything to everybody. And that's what, why we need more stories. Rami, there's no, there should be no community that has one show that speaks for all of them. And that's actually very unfair to put that burden on one show that's supposed to be representing an entire community. So I think the work that we can do as a community is say, yeah, we have our critiques, but tell more of our stories. And this is doing a good job for the stories that it wants to tell. I mean, I remember though when you know Friends was responsible for representing all white upper middle class people. <laughs> <laughs> they got a lot of criticism. I mean, the, the so thing is, I and all and all I, New York City apartments. That yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, Please, of details course, of New York City. Turn about is, turn about is fair play. Right, right. And of course, you know, the only story white women have is the Queen's Gambit. That's it, right? Like that's the that's the first time yeah. they saw themselves. <laughs> Wasn't it me? I did, well, uh, Reza, that once said that when, when when Fresh Off the Boat first came out, because you 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 received criticism for for United States of Al, and he pointed out that when Fresh Off the Boat came um, premiered, that there was a lot of crit criticism from the Asian community. Yeah, Fresh Off the Boat, Blackish yeah. had Blackish, had yeah, yeah, Blackish yeah. Is still there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're, 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 no we're no different than any yeah. other community. Yeah. I mean, these, these are healthy. These are healthy yeah. issues, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. So, really so Maya, you know, tell us a little bit about how you you responded, how you felt when you saw some of the responses to United States of Al. Oh God. I I look, I think the um I've been, you know, I'm old, right? We've been in this game for a long time. And um the, you know, this is I think just telling. So I'm an artist, right? So I'm I'm I, I'm just trying to make stuff. Right. So I've had to do all these other things because I am this brand of an artist, because I'm an immigrant, I'm Muslim, I got a funny name, I'm an introvert. All of those things matter. That's the funny thing. Right. Uh, 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 and 
And so I've had to learn to be media savvy. I've had to learn to understand how big media promotes things and how you can help them and, and how you have to navigate that field. I've had to, um, I, I clearly understand the power of fandom and uh, fandom is actually a big part of the way we think about the stories we tell. And I've also always been an advocate for the fact that um, you cannot, uh, that well, you can, and we do this all the time, but you shouldn't. And it is a failure on our part as storytellers to limit the storytelling to the confines of the show itself, between the credits, if you would. Um, storytelling, you know, the, the show is one thing, but how you talk about the show, the articles written about the show, the conversations you create with the communities around the show, that's all part of the same storytelling. And all of those are really powerful levers that you have to use. And not because I want to, or it just makes me a better artist to spend all this time doing all these other things, but because I have to do it in order to survive. Because we had to do it in order to make it to where we are, right? So to be honest with you, we knew what the criticism was gonna be. Um, and uh, we knew it was gonna be around sort of the promotion of it, you know? Uh, we also knew that once people started seeing the show and saw the extent of the season, even though we didn't have the usual 22 episodes to work with, they will understand. And especially, like the most important people are the people in whose identity you're trading, right? So for us, it was Afghans, specifically Afghan interpreters, but Afghan community, as well as the veteran community. Uh, and that, those were the two communities that we were trading in. My wife's actually from Ohio. So I also had my entire half of my family who was from Ohio, who was going to be a community that I had to personally deal with. Um, and so, you know, I, I was pretty confident that if we were able, if we were given a chance, uh, we would be able to show uh, uh, what all of those years of experience would bring. I mean, I think the key thing to remember is that between East of La Brea, which is amazing, and I was at the premiere, and I absolutely love that show, and I think it's incredible, but uh, Margaret talked about the audience, right? And, and Hulu uh, and Rami, which I love, again, uh, with all its complexities, I love, I love that show uh, because it is complex and because it is uh, challenging. Uh, and because it's funny as shit, you know, in, in such a quirky, incredible way, unique way, uh, which is wonderful about Rami. But our show itself, what is it? It's an eight, now we're at 8.30 p.m. on a Thursday on a network TV. Like, I have to slap myself once in a while to go like, what the, like that time slot, if you look at what's in that time slot, it's madness, you know, to actually be able to, after all this time, to get a show yeah. in that time slot, that places six million people a week across all demographics, and and frankly, the ma vast majority of people who were upset never watch network TV. Right. Certainly not sitcoms on network. So what we were mostly con uh, concerned with is the people who do watch network television at eight thirty p.m. on a Thursday night and who watch sitcoms and what was going to impact of our show on those people. How are we going to make sure that those people love the show and that we? begin to challenge them in a way that they had never been challenged before and introduce them to ideas that they've never been introduced before. Um, so, so, so yeah, I wasn't too concerned about it in so far as it didn't erase what we had done right, right? What really irked me more than anything else was that the criticism erased us, erased me, erased Reza, and erased more importantly, the fact that we had four writers in a network television room, they were Afghans, <laughs> um, that we had a writer's assistant, a research assistant, one of whom is now a producer, the other one who is now, you know, four people in the, in the WGA who are empowered and actually creating these characters. They had to be erased for the criticism to exist. And that is what I, that really pissed me off because if representation matters, then full stop, we have them, right? Um, that representation doesn't mean that you have to agree with my taste or my politics, right? Uh, you you have every every uh, every right to say you know what I'm not into this genre or I don't like this is not very funny or or that I don't agree with your politics fair but you cannot say that we're not representing and we're not representative because we are and to erase us is 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 deeply problematic and that was sort of what I responded to I knew the show would stand on its own two legs and thank God it has we are uh, we are one of the top comedies on TV and we're one of the ten most watched television shows on on American television. It's, it's insane.
Wow, that is time. that is. Congratulations on that, and congratulations mm -hmm. on wrapping um, the season. The, the season finale aired um, yesterday, right? Yes. Um, and you know, you said something that was interesting about the the stories, not just what happens in between the credits. And um, I, I really appreciated you helping us to understand the story of the production, right? Um, of who's in the room, and um, Sue. So, you know, you have had meetings with people in the industry. How do you explain the stakes of of this of 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 this um, of of Muslim how Muslims are are portrayed of the storytelling about Muslims? How do you how do you talk to people about the stakes of that? Uh, I mean, I I just got to still comment on Mahed's um, show. I love your show, and congratulations. And honestly, these are really happy problems. I just I just got to say that. Um, well, it, 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 it's, to answer your question, it, the conversations we had, you know, we were having after 9-11 um, and the conversations we had after the 2016 elections are different, were different. Uh, in, you know, prior to Donald Trump, we were having, you know, damage control questions, uh, hate, cri hate crime, uh, you know, how bad representation and harmful representation can start wars, how they can um, hurt people literally in hate crime, for, you know, hate crimes with hate crimes. Um, so after, I, after Donald Trump, the conversations were more proactive. It was, I think the industry um, wanted to resist what was happening with Donald Trump. And so that's where we saw the more proactive creation of characters and of storylines. And so prior to um, Donald Trump, it was, look, our people are dying. Our people are, you know, there's hate crime against our people. Uh, you know, uh, wars are being started because of Hollywood representation of Muslim majority countries. And so it was just very negative, very damage control um, type of conversations. I wouldn't say they were pro productive. Um, but we had to educate the industry and and take them to where they are now. Uh, Donald Trump comes along, networks call, production houses call, saying, "Look, we want to create Muslim characters. We want to create a Muslim storyline. Can you help us?" So it was a very different kind of conversation. Um, I believe in my heart that Rami, United States of Al, um, a new show called We Are Lady Parts. I believe they would have would have uh, premiered anyway because honestly it was a per it's a perfect storm now right we have amazing talent we had talent but the access is different and it's still growing i mean we have a long way to go i'm not sugarcoating it uh, we have people like franklin we have people like you know other other executives who believe in our cause who are lifting up our voices and so um it it just i feel this would have happened anyway um i feel that um what happened in six, 2016 actually helped nudge us along. The Muslim ban, as horrible as it was, um, helped nudge us along. The Black Muslim narratives still need to be like elevated. Vo black Muslim writers and, and, and directors and producers need to be elevated because we're still seeing, having conversations about Mus um, Arab, Middle Eastern, um, South Asian characters, and the Black Muslim characters is, is still... Um, not really represent then is not being represented. So there are a lot of conversations to be had. But my net net answer to your question is conversations are now more proactive. Um, you got May Hassan, who is now a co-executive producer of Rami. You got Mayhad and and Riza. Chuck Lorre, uh, man, that's all I got to say. I love Chuck R uh, Lorre's, um, you know, uh, series. I mean, they just they're so. Um, Serious like like um, mom was all it's about alcohol alcoholism and how to navigate um, you know certain addictions. I mean, it's real. It's happening. It's happening. We have a long way to go, but it's the conversations are different. And Franklin Leonard and the blacklist. I I know it would have ultimately happened, but honestly, it happened at the perfect time. And so I I personally think the best is yet to come. Well, you know, so Franklin and Sue just passed the ball to you, so I want to, <laughs> I want to follow. Um, you know, because you all have done this with so many other communities, I wonder um, what are some of the lessons you think that we should take 
um, or, or have in mind as we tackle these issues of both like how to push forward in the industry, but also this sense of responsiveness or accountability um, to the communities out of which um, this work is coming? Yeah, I mean, look, I think that it's difficult because I, the reality is, is that we, I think we all feel a greater responsibility to the communities that we're trying to represent, but we also have to work within the structure of a, of a capitalist business that requires large amounts of capital in order to execute a work of art, right? And so it's a different set of considerations than if you're trying to write a novel or you're trying to make a painting or you're trying to record music, you know, you're asking somebody, no matter who, you know, no matter what you're making for hundreds of thousands, if not millions or tens of millions of dollars to do this thing. Um, and then on top of it, you have a double bottom line as a member of a community that you want to be responsible to in order to make it good and profitable. Um, and so I think the best model is to make the commercial argument for the merits of the work, especially when the merits have historically been undervalued. It makes it really hard to make that argument. It's harder than it should be, and it's harder than it will be for a lot of your peers. But you know, if I look at the GLAD list, for example, we have a few years under our belt with that, and we're seeing a lot of those scripts that were on it now get made. Um, in fact, Billy Porter's uh, directorial debut will be a script that was on uh, the GLAD list from a Latinx writer, notably, um, about I, with a trans lead. Um, so I think that, and that not neither was that the Latinx list or um, you know the other sort of other list. So I think it's just really important that we keep making sure to raise the visibility of people doing great work, make sure that we are all working in concert to elevate that work to people who can sort of get it made, support that work when it does get made and made well. Um, and then, I mean, I, I think that's that's sort of, unfortunately, the ball game. Um, I wish there was a more sort of dramatic solution, but I, I don't really see one for any of us. But again, the, the, the highlight for me, the headline is, this is the best outcome for everybody is more representation. It's sort of morally and ethically in terms of how we all live in the world and the safety in which we all live in the world, but also the amount of money that the film and television industry can make. Um, and it's one of the rare cases where you can do well by doing good. And if you're not going to, you probably need to be honest about the reasons why you're choosing not to. All right. So we're gonna move into our final round with our panelists. Mm -hmm. But while we do that, we want to encourage all of you who are watching on Crowdcast to use the Ask a Question box to post your questions for the panelists because we will um, have them respond to some of your questions shortly. Um, we did pose a question to you, the audience, um, of what projects you would like to see. And I, I know that we've been getting some of that. So I encourage our panelists to look at that as I move into our final um, part of our conversation, you know, Toni Morrison uh, famously talked about racism being a distraction. You know, she said, you know, they'll say you have no history and you spend all this time convincing them you do. They'll say you have no language. I'm paraphrasing the great Toni Morrison, but there'll always be something else she said, you know, and so what we should just do is just do the work. And so I want to go around to all of the panelists and ask you um, in a distraction free mindset, um, what what would your work look like? What are your sources of hope? And where is that hope taking you to? What are your, to use the phrase of Robin Kelly, the historian, freedom dreams? Um, so I'm gonna start, and we're gonna get, get here from all of you. Um, and I'll start with Marguerite. Yeah, well, I think, well, there's two parts of, of my dream and, and the work that we do, which is really training. Okay, which is really training. Training creative. Training creative. Sorry, I'm getting Sorry. a little bit of feedback, so I hope you're not getting feedback, but I'll try to ignore my own voice looping back. But for me, the the what I hope to do, right, and, and as somebody that is an educator, is that our creatives, right, that it is a co-creation, but we also work to have an anti-racism frame, and that even if we're coming from our community that we understand, are there tropes, are there, are there things that we're falling into, and that we can start to break through those and understand like how we can either turn those tropes on its head and create counter narratives, right? So, so for me, like in in the kind of world that that I would like to create is one where storytellers actually have more power, where it's not just all um, by the the capitalist model, where it's like if the mainstream audience loves it 
then that means that it's a win. But it's like, does are the people that are impacted by the stories on the Monday morning on school, right? Like the, the boys named Ahmed or the girls that look like that, like, are they going to be teased and made fun of? Or is somebody going to say, hey, you remind me of that character. And now I relate to you a little bit more. Right. And and I actually had a little bit of that experience. I went to the dentist and somebody said it was a Rami character. And that was the first time where a black Muslim where somebody said, I look, I reminded them of a portrayal of a Muslim on screen. And so it's more of that, more of our children, our young people see themselves in the heroes, right? It's like, is the more of the Ms. Marvels. And it's like enough of that creativity where the stakes won't be so high that we can all kind of create. And so even for me, the, the other part of me is as a writer, as somebody that that does create and as I co-create is that there is space, right? For, for us to really utilize storytelling to build our power, right? Where we can understand our issues and we can come together and work towards making, to envisioning a more just society towards envisioning a future where we exist, right? You know, like a lot of times, like I, my, my mentor, Dr. Amina, um, sorry, we have like a little kitten in the background, but like Dr. Amina um, Adin had said is like, you know, many black people, we're so tired, like we're so stressed out with circumstances that we don't have a chance to dream. And so, um, you know, it's it's that we have a chance to dream and and deal with kittens and everything. So. <laughs> that was that was beautiful. That was beautiful. Uh, Maya, um, what are your freedom dreams? Oh God, freedom dreams. I I don't know if I can allow myself to have them because uh, you know because of the trauma, right? So I think I think um, so many of us uh, uh, have experienced so much trauma that that trauma. Uh, your self-defense mechanism prevents you from thinking in that way. That's at least how I feel, you know, having grown up in, in the way that I've grown up between Iran and here and, and sort of growing up in the eighties as a kid with a funny name from an immigrant country, Iran specifically. Um, and, uh, and then trying to sort of figure out how to navigate it. So it just sounds so great to me, but I don't know how to answer the question. Um, uh, what I can tell you is, for me, uh, at this moment, a distraction is, I think a lot of it, I feel like the talent is there, the market is shifting, um, uh, you know, the, the, the massive buying power is actually people of color, um, uh, the talent is there, everything is there. there we're, we're facing a lot of inefficiencies, right? There, there are it, certain individuals within the system, the way the system works specifically, even our own communities, you know, to a long time, at least in my generation, you know, nobody said, yeah, yeah, go be a writer and go be an actor. And, you know, we, and we spend, we don't spend enough time uh, talking about how we have screwed ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. our, all of our parents uh, can't stop talking about how it's important that we look presentable, but as a community, we've forgotten our face. Our face is our storytellers and our storytellers are not who we invest in, are not who we, champion uh so we those of us who have had to become artists from these communities a lot of us have to have not only fight the system but also fight our own communities our own families um in, in many ways and i think a distraction free environment is is it for me is an environment where as an artist failure is what i tell my kids all the time don't be afraid to fail failure is how you learn as an artist of as an artist of color as a muslim artist an immigrant artist um i have never felt I have had the opportunity to fail. I cannot fail. I can't fail because if I fail, the system says you're a failure. We tried it. That's it. You had your shot. And if I also fail, my community has so much expectation that that, that I can't. And, and if you don't fail as an artist, you can't improve. And so a distraction environment is an environment in which where I'm allowed to fail. I'm allowed to try things and fail and not uh, be terrified of losing everything I've worked so hard for. All right, Metha, how about yours? And and I, I want us to try to keep it to two minutes each. I know it's hard, <laughs> but we do have some questions rolling in from the audience and I want us to get to. So Metha. As I wanted to start with a story, thanks for <laughs> the time limit on me, the academic, great, thanks. Um, well, as, as we've mentioned, the ecosystem of cinema that I grew up in was a, 
a man speaking gibberish in Father of the Bride and that being Arabic. Um, the Libyans coming out of nowhere in Back to the Future and shooting people up. And Jasmine <laughs> walking around with Midriff Bear and the only woman speaking character. And during this time, my father would take me to political protests, city council meetings, canvassing, phone banks, and he would introduce me as his future congresswoman. And had I not had that sort of push and motivation and belief in a future beyond the imagination of this moment, I don't know what I would have realized for myself. So he provided a way to distract from the distractions, right? And um, what, I, what I was thinking about too, Zaheer, as I was recounting the story is something else that Robin says, Robin D.G. Kelly in the intro to his book, Freedom Dreams, about what poetry does, because what he's trying to do is link social movements, freedom dreaming, and what the arts do. And so he zeroed in on poetry and he said, poetry transports, poetry transports us to another place, compels us to relive horrors, and more importantly, enables us to imagine a new society. And then he goes on to talk about it as trying to create poetic knowledge, but basically having the ability to have an unencumbered imagination of possibility, that's what that freedom dreaming space is. Can I be in that unencumbered imagination of not having to explain myself? Can I be committed to truth telling and not fearing that if I talk about an abusive parent, that they're not gonna be re reified as that terror trope? How can I, exist in a space where my my art artistry as i'm like writing these treatments can explore themes that are true and honest to characters that are emotionally resonant and to live in that space is what's really important to me and is that freedom dream space all right thank you um sue yeah i'm i work for a public policy advocacy group so here so distractions <laughs> are a daily thing I mean, seriously, like, seriously yeah so i mean the distractions do however teach and they they help us grow uh, you know they help create new partnerships but if i were to dream in the space of hollywood um i would love to see our cons I, I would love to see our uh, consulting work end because there's because the industry has all the screenwriters they need of every single ethnicity, inter you know, sectional identity, um, and and we are all telling our own stories, Muslims, you know, all of us, all of us, not just Muslims. That's really what I would dream of, and I. I, I hope, you know, we, we are um, going to get there as an organization. I do hope that because um, I really don't, I really want to work our way out of consulting because the screenwriting labs, the identifying of screenwriters, getting them hired, getting them in the room, that's what makes us happy. So. All right. Thank you. Franklin, how about your freedom dreams for us? Yeah, I mean, it's ironic. And with respect to the other panelists, my freedom dream is that we don't have to have this conversation, right? That that all of us can spend all the time that we want to be focused on work on the work and not on making sure that we're not miss, you know, missing and maligned. Um, and so that, you know, as writers can write and directors can direct and actors can act because I think all of us, and I don't know what the exact percentage is, but I know that for me, between 33 and 50% of my work is actually not sort of profit bearing or sort of the work that my peers who have some more pursuits are focused on. Um, and certainly like my brain is not focused on those things. You know, my freedom dream is not when I read a script on the Muslim list, not having to think about how I can make it at a smaller budget than I would if it were not a Muslim character, because Muslim characters are not being undervalued uh, in the marketplace. Um, and and it's, it's, it's interesting. Like, when I think about the Robin D.G. Kelly quote, not to get back to this sort of materialist point of view on the world, but like, 
poetry, it's, it's inexpensive to make poetry. It's really expensive to make film and television. And that's where that friction really comes. Um, but it's also where the most powerful ever is. And, you know, if, if I can write the songs of a nation, what need do I have to write its laws? Um, but if you need capital to write the songs, the people that have the capital and the control of those things are the ones that are able to write the songs and the laws. And that's the situation we all find ourselves in. So for me, it's like, the, the the my freedom dream is sort of the release of the extra workload that functions as a tax on all of us who are members of these communities um because and again not to, again if we were fully unfettered to focus on the work what glorious things would we be able to make and in cynical terms how well would hollywood be able to monetize it yeah yeah well, let's turn ourselves to some of the questions that have been coming in. Um, if you're watching this and you have questions, please post it in the chat and we'll try to get to them. Um, so one question we have is, do you think we need a Muslim version of Roots, the TV series? Would that kind of narrative help reframe the role of Muslims in the making or building of the United States? And because I'm working with Metha on a documentary series project called American Muslims, A History Revealed, I'm going to throw that to you, Metha. Yeah, we're doing it. Um, so I, I'm sure Zahir can jump in and explain more, but we're really trying to conceptualize a fun, engaging way to do a multi-series, kind of like the Black Church or Eyes on the Prize for the Muslim community. And we're going to also do digital shorts aimed at students for educational institutions because we also need to very clearly make a game plan, a strategy to engage folks in the Gen Z, and I don't know the next generation after Gen Z, um, as we're doing this culture change and this narrative change work. And so what we're gonna be looking at are those stories through the eyes of Muslims who are gonna seek out our history and reveal it on the screen through those shorts um, and through a much longer docuseries. And you can donate too right now. You can be a part of yes. this storytelling. Do I sound hey. like a PBS? Um, Frankly, <laughs> just finished telling us about like the material considerations. We, gotta, so. we do. I mean, yeah. the material considerations are real. It's folks. real. That's real. If, if you knew how little we were working on, you would, um, in terms of labor compensation, as Franklin did mention, um, you would you would put in that money. You would put it in. Zahir, do you want to add anything else to that? No, I just I think you know we we're drawn inspiration from Eyes on the Prize, from um, Asian Americans that series, from um, uh, the Black Church series, from the 1619 Project. We're reimagining. Well, not even reimagining, but we're revealing American history with the ways that Muslims have been uh, in that history. So looking forward to um, developing that project as we go. Um, okay, so we have some more questions. Um, are there any efforts or fellowships to connect Muslim actors with career development support? Um, I know that we have a few fellowships around screenwriting, so maybe I'll throw this to Whoever wants to answer, but I'm, I'm looking at Sue. Um, Sue, do you know of any um, um, fellowships that are, are for, for actors? I, we don't really work in the acting space. Um, so I apologize. I actually don't know that answer. So, okay. Yeah, I can. There I is. Can, yeah. Oh, okay. Go ahead. So, Marguerite, go ahead, Marguerite, then Maytha. I was trying to find there is an organization that just started uh, for Muslim actors. And I know like they're actively looking at building, right? So this is this, this is in a, in its infancy, right? And and it's important for us as a community to invest in these efforts, right? To donate, to support, even supporting donor collaboratives and express those interests. Like this is what I want my money to go into. Because really when we are talking about social change, like doing this kind of narrative change work or building that kind of early pipelines, like this is one of the best investments that we can to do the systems change work. And so if you're going to the donor collaboratives, whether it's like Pillars Fund or like some of the other ones, American Muslim Community Foundation is saying, like, look, I want my money to go towards organizations that are building this, then, then the people that are leading those funds are more likely to support. Even if you want to be the recipient, if you're expressing that to them, it will, it 
will show up. But I would say definitely follow. I'll try to get the handle of of that this organization. They are looking at ways of building like the kind of pipelines of for for actors so that they can get those roles. Yeah, so that's the Muslim American casting. Um, they are also listed in the appendix of the blueprint report, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. And also what we've from neglected to mention around the solutions for the blueprint and the missing the line report um, in collaboration with Pillars Ford Foundation and Left Handed Production, there's a Muslim advisory board that's gonna be integral to picking. Um, if you're an artist, you should apply for this. Um, a um, a $25,000 unrestricted grant for Muslim artists and we've, uh, uh, as I understand it, they've kept it pretty open-ended. Um, applications should be open, and I believe they're due this fall, so please look into it. It's been described as a Muslim McCarthy Genius Award. So send that around, and I'm gonna send a link to the Muslim American casting as well. Thank you. Okay, so I think we have time for one more question, um, and the question uh, is- Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Zahir, can I just like, uh, May, is Muslim American casting, is that a fellowship? They give, they give out fellowships for actors? No, 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 no. Oh, that's okay. not a fellowship. That's just a, right. I that's just what you're yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So the okay. $25,000 fellowship is right. through, yeah. Pillars, yeah, I just wanted to clarify because I, I really want to whoever asked the question about acting because we don't work in that space. I just want to make sure that they get the resource. So fellowship okay. for acting is, was the question, is that correct? Yes, yes. But the, but the Pillars grant, you could be an actor. Perfect, and also, okay, good. Yeah, it's, okay. it's, it's artists it's, broadly just defined. Just wanted to clarify, just wanted to clarify. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Excellent, um, excellent. So artists broadly defined, but focused on Hollywood. Is that correct, Matha? For this year, yes, exactly. For this year. Um, okay, so this is the last question from the audience before we wrap up, and that is how do we ensure that representation isn't just representation for representation's sake. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm gonna throw that to Mahyad because I, you know, I think that this is, you know, some of the things that we've been grappling with in this conversation. So Mahyad, how do we talk about representation in a way that is um, more than symbolic? Yeah, I mean, I think that's that is uh, <clears throat> that is the the crux of it. I think. I think that those of us who are working in industry, uh, who are representing, if you would, uh, and yes, there is a few of us, <laughs> you know, and there is there should be far, far more. But those of us who are working in the industry, um, oftentimes it feels like um, we um, it's assumed that we are either powerless or irrelevant, um, and 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 that's just frankly wrong. It's, uh, um, I think the, the posture towards representation, um, as Franklin has uh, pointed out, uh, generally speaking for the industry, uh, for those of us who are in it, uh, is success. It, representation isn't a recipe for a, some sort of a moral or political quota. A representation is who we are as a nation. We have a narrative deficit disorder, right? Uh, and, uh, and, and, and representation is how we survive as a society. Uh, if this society does not represent itself, when it looks in the mirror, if, if it, what it sees is not, is a distortion of itself, how can we uh, move towards some sort of a common future? So representation isn't about individuals. Representation is about us as a society that when we look in the mirror, we see what we look like in our entirety. And that's what representation is. And uh, when representation becomes a way of uh, talking about specific things around individual people, that's when it gets tricky. Uh, and, uh, and that's where we sort of can get into these sort of questions about representation for representation's sake. And, and really no one plays that game better than the industry itself. You know, it's yeah. like, oh, how can I pick a couple of people to say, because, because that's what's important to you. So they're, they're doing it out of reaction to concerns, right? So Oscar so white, how can I address this very quickly? So Oscar no longer so white, even though it's still so white, right? Uh, 
And, and so we have to be a lot more sophisticated about what we look at representation. Representation is a goal and it is only met when the things that we consume um, are uh, represent us. And I believe absolutely when, when we get there, we actually have the healthiest, most robust, most uh, profitable entertainment industry and business ever in its history. Um, I think that's that's absolutely a, a great response. Um, I, I, I think I want to be cognizant of the time. I want to keep it if anyone wants to respond. But I know in conversations I've had with Maytha, we've, we've grappled with this idea of representation. And this might be something that may be helpful for us as well, um, in that the, the sort of the first stage of this work was, you know, people were just like, we just need people in the room. We just need people in the room. Um, and that was the question of representation. And then the conversation shifted to authenticity, right? Like, are the people in the room the right people? Um, and that's, you know, there's there's like many ways to answer that question that you get into purism and it's like, is this person representative? Is, is this authentic? Um, and in conversations with May, um, I suggested we we also think about intimacy, right? Which talks about what is the relationship of the people in the room to the communities that they are purporting to represent, right? Do they have that intimate knowledge of the life of the community? Do they have that relationship? Um, and does that relationship, um, you know, bring about a certain kind of responsiveness, a certain kind of accountability. And so um, I would put forward, you know, for us to think not just in terms of representation, not just in terms of authenticity, but in terms of the relationships or the intimacy of, of the kinds of presences that we have in the industry. Um, but I wanna let you all um, say anything that you wanna say before we wrap up for the evening. So um, does anyone wanna jump in on, on either that question or previous points raised? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that I, I, it's really, I, I'd love to actually have this conversation about intimacy. And I think that's a whole other panel, but I think it's a double-edged sword and we have to be very careful about what we expect and then how that also limits the artist's um, ability to actually work and, and collaborate, right? Yeah, no, uh, it does. You but, know, you know uh, on the flip side, it, the artist's ability to work is sometimes enabled by the community pressure, right? Um, oh, and absolutely. so then what is the artist's response? I mean, it, it's a, it is, you know, I, I think about, you know, um, um, Langston Hughes um, writing The Negro Artist in the Racial Mountain during the time of the Harlem Renaissance, where he, he writes about, you know, a poet who says, I just, I don't want to be a Negro poet. I just want to be a poet, right? Um, and so there's this, always this tension about art versus propaganda. And I, I certainly wouldn't ask for propaganda, but I would ask for acknowledgement that many of us are occupying spaces that were created by people out in the street, right? Um, by protesters, by activists, by organizers. Um, and, and how do we ensure that the promise that we represent um, does, does, is that promise, you know, and, and at the same time, honor the work of artists. And I think it's a really, um, it's an engagement, it's a provocation, but it's always something, you know, I, I think, I know that I personally have walked in spaces that were created by people who came before me, um, I have walked in spaces that were created by people who would have never been able to walk in those spaces, who still might not be able to walk in those spaces. And I have to carry something from them with me in those spaces, right? And it's, it isn't always like done right. It isn't always like the best way, but it is something that at least I have to have on my mind, right? And so I think that to me, is one of the challenges for those of us who are talking about the kinds of, of power that we are having access to um, is it isn't just, you know, someone didn't just like pluck me out of like, you know, suburban Maryland. It was like, oh, you just, you just the man, like folks threatened to burn stuff down, <laughs> like folks protested, you know, like all of that is part of what I have inherited and I have to carry that. So oh, I, I think that. That's yeah. something that we have to yeah. absolutely. To but I, I think I think that I, I just wanted to just maybe say this because I think it's really important and we don't say it enough is that 
in that conversation, we have to recognize that artists and activists are not the same people, right? And that they both play a critical role. Artists didn't weren't birthed by activists, and activists weren't birthed by artists. But artists, what artists and activists do together, is what can make a better world. But if, when artists try to be activists, when activists try to be artists, the results aren't always very good. It's really important that we understand that we play very different functions as an artist. Um, and an activist, I had to. I've always, always had to grapple with this notion of what is, what are, what are those two parts of me, and what is my role. The best that I can do is to create an environment, a milieu, a social consciousness in which the activist work can be more successful. Right? If I can, if my work can create constituents for the activists to go out and actually do the work of real work of changing the world, the hardware work. Uh, so, so as an artist, I think of myself as a software person. I'm, I deal in the human consciousness space. Um, as an activist, you are actually dealing with policies and laws, etc. And but it is when those two things are working in a in a in a healthy dynamic with each other that we can really make a have the most amount of impact. Um, can I just point you to if you haven't already, uh, Robin's book, his last chapter is on the surrealist movement, because he is looking at the work of art in the the power that they have in shifting the political arena and the center for cultural power they talk about how culture has a 10 year they're 10 years ahead of politics so they start to produce art that shifts the political arena within 10 years so i think that there's a really an interesting dynamic relationship that i'm sure we need hours to debate uh, yeah. and that that's a great conversation that i yeah, that that is. Is. <laughs> yeah no, look this is always how it happens right like the last five minutes is when the <laughs> well, stuff blows up, up. Uh, yeah. but that's, 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 that's great we, we we do um frankly did you want to add something there's one thing that, that actually might be a weirdly perfect close and i find myself you you're sort of referring to the story all the time and that's actually a quote from two Tupac Shakur, of all people. Um, you know, he was interviewed shortly before he was murdered. He was asked, I think it might have been by Kurt Loder, like, do you think your, you know, your music's going to change the world? And his response was to say, like, look, that's a ridiculous question. My music's not going to change the world. But I'll tell you this, my music will change the minds that change the world. And if I keep telling people how dirty it is, maybe someone will clean it up. And that, for me, has always been how I reconcile those two things, because it, it still preserves the freedom of the artist to do and say what they want about the world. But like my aunt said, it's about creating an environment where the activists have an easier time imagining and making real the shared dream that we all have. Um, and I think, you know, if we can do that, it's something. It may not be everything, but it's definitely something. Well, I think that's the perfect note to end on, on this last night of the M Word Town Hall series. Thank you, Marguerite, Mahyad, Franklin, Sue, and Maitha, mm -hmm. and to all of the participants on this week's series of Town Halls. Um, thank you to the attendees, to the people who tuned in on Crowdcast. Thanks to our partners, Sapelo Square and MPAX Hollywood Bureau to our sponsor, the Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Arts Building Bridges Program. To learn about all of our panelists and the M Word series, follow the links in the chat and follow them all on social media and follow PEN America at PEN America. Thank you again um, for tuning in for this wonderful conversation. I think we've laid the groundwork for a part two. Pen America, whenever you're ready, we're ready. Um, just not tonight. Uh, so good night, everyone. Take care and um, you know, keep freedom dreaming. <laughs>